Uh, I'm really pleased that so many of you turned up. The weather conditions are so horrendous. I mean, what? Must Stormy be weather? Like several feet of snow out there. So you managed to negotiate the snowflakes. Sorry, I don't think I'm standing in the right spot. There we go. Uh, all right, everyone got, uh, got drinks ready to go. So we've got three speakers for you this evening. Uh, the first two are here in person. The third is speaking remotely in, uh, uh, in Lo I think he's in London. And apparently he's telling me the weather conditions down there are seriously bad. Uh, I, I, I think he must be at home because he was talking about his neighbor's, um, I think it was a greenhouse, sort of doing cartwheels through his garden or something. So apparently they've got very, very high, high winds down there. So hopefully the connection will be fine and it'll go seamlessly. Um, it's the first time we've held an IoT Scotland meetup at this very fine establishment. I feel like I'm coming home because I'm kind of Edinburgh Uni alumni, I suppose. I was based in Appleton Tower for, for a couple of years, which is that very tall um, build. This is it that way? <laughs> <laughs> Over there, in that direction. You couldn't miss it on your way in. That beautiful building. Actually, it's a lot better looking now than it was. It was horrendous. Uh, beautified with the new cladding and so on. So I, I'm very grateful. I feel like I'm kind of coming home in a weird kind of way because we're a pop-up. We, we, as you know, we kind of travel around and we, uh, we're always looking for new and exciting locations around Edinburgh to host our events. So we're very, very uh, privileged and uh, pleased and happy to be um, in the Edinburgh University uh, Informatics Building uh, today. So uh, thank you so much for agreeing to, to host us and for co-organizing the event. So would you like to say a few words, Dave? Uh, just, just a few, actually, so um, I'm going to keep you warm, but thanks, Simon, and I guess it's our pleasure to host the Simon team meet up, and hopefully this will be the first of many. Uh, my name is David Richardson, I'm with the School of Informatics, and as Simon said, we've got a number of different uh, things happening at the moment. So the Apple Tower, which uh, Simon and many other ones is actually coming back on stream at the end of this year. We're refurbishing that at the moment. Behind us, we've got the new base centre opening up, which actually joins onto this building. But we've got a number of different groups from designers to mathematicians to mathematicians. And we've also got space for corporate research and development groups coming in there. And the theme that we're really pushing around with um, the base centre is the interaction between people, data, and systems. And obviously, IP will play a big part in that, along with all these uh, other new enabling technologies that we're seeing popping up. We've got a big interest in robotics, and uh, we've got a blockchain initiative that we're just about to kick off as well. Um, this week is quite uh, timely because we've launched an IoT week, and this is the first LoRa challenge week that we've launched uh, using a new LoRa network that we've spun up within the university. And we've got four teams with challenges from the City of Edinburgh Council, the Transport for Edinburgh, we've got festivals involved in that. And we're also very fortunate to have PyCon sponsor that event. And Fred uh, is here tonight from PyCon. And we might have bumped into him earlier on there. And I also learned earlier on that there is such a thing as a, a LoRa enabled snow sensor. So that's maybe something we all need. Uh, just like to point out the bathrooms, if anybody's looking for them around the corner, uh, we've got a fire exit over here, and just out the main entrance where you came in. No drills planned tonight, so if there is anything, please make your way to the exits. And uh, that's all I want to say. Welcome to the Informatics Forum, and uh, look forward to reading evening. Thank you. Simon. <laughs> We're building a community. We've got about a thousand. A safe place for you to out all of your kindred spirits who are into the same sorts of things that you are. And, uh, and as a result, this is your opportunity to 
to reach out to other members by the live stream um, or in person to talk about projects involved with. Maybe you're working on a kind of hacker maker um, project and you're kind of stuck and you need assistance, some help. But you just want to show it off. You, know, you just want to say, this is the kind of project I'm working on. I've got a Raspberry Pi, Pi and I'm hacking a smart home device. Um, so, or maybe you're, you're thinking of starting an IT uh, company or um, maybe something. What was it? Raspberry Pi. Pleasure for, from the first for Russell. Welcome. Come on in. Hi, Robert. Uh, I'm Armino. I'm going to increase about 3,000 credits. I'm not the first production run. Yeah. I'm planning on the run. Very cool. Um, it's all in it's been for about two years now, so... Two years? Yeah, okay, it's, uh, can I move on? What's <laughs> <laughs> taking you so long? Um, <laughs> Dr. Patrick Hickey. So we were on the same Entrepreneur in Residence program, weren't we? That's, that's what brought me to Edinburgh almost ten years ago now. Ten years, yeah. Yep. So it's a shame Tim, uh, Dr. Tim Willis wasn't here, because he was, again, one of the original members from the uh, co-organizers, but he's in... Uh, uh, Tokyo at the moment, lucky him. So, uh, Simon Chapel, where are you? I know that you would. There you go. You want to say something about uh, a Laura project you were involved with? Is that right? Um, uh, For your project, Easter Road. So, what what is the deal? Can anyone kind of log on to it? Or I was going to ask you as my next question: What's the range? But I know Sergio is going to be talking about the range of your LP1. Even yeah. Okay. So the, the best, best way to describe it is it's like, like a half a G Wi-Fi connection. connection. Kind, kind of. But for, for, for devices as well. Yeah, so it's really, 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 really low band. Um, what, like 1990s dollar? Not even. 1956K. Uh, so US robotics. So the first can be quite quick, but you're, you're looking at, um, I mean, the recommendations for the things that work. If you're following their standards, it's, it's something like eight bytes. Is a, is, a, is a packet, and you can probably get away with one of those every 15 minutes. <laughs> so, you know, you're, I'm, I'm using a you know, flood sensor data and stuff like that, but okay. you want a, you're not sending, you could send a, a very short text message, but yeah. that's about it. You're not sending live video or audio or photos. Or no, of course not. You'll bring on 5G for that. But um, I, I'd just be interested, it's not really, probably a conversation for now, to, to know, you know the differences between 
say LoRa and Sigfox or NBIoT or Ingenue or any of the other sort of low power wide area networks in terms of latency and speed, but like I said, it's probably a conversation for another time. Anyone else, would you like to stand up, introduce yourself to the room and uh, make your announcement? Hi guys, um, my name is Michael Barry, I'm an emergency medicine doctor here in Edinburgh, also an um, Edinburgh alumnus. I know this area mainly because Pottery was a night called Big Cheese. Um, <laughs> you may know that if you're Edinburgh alumnus. Um, but I'm also a software developer. Um, in the last year I've got a couple of different ideas. I'm, I'm working on uh, an application with Professor of Cardiology at the Royal, which is just kind of coming to close at the moment. Um, and I'm also looking at a few other ideas. I'm looking So is Michael Gary, who is an ethical hacker, is he here? He did RSVP. Ooh, no show. So we've got, yeah, I always uh, estimate around 50% no show, but typically get yeah, between 20 and 30%, which is not bad. But because of this horrendous weather we're having, sometimes that's the reason why we physically can't make it. So I'm forward to, there's a guy called Gary, I'll connect you. Um, he's an ethical hacker at Napier, I think. Really sharp, really smart. Uh, and, and great in terms of you know, the, the, uh, the security side. If you're dealing with patient data, which I think you are, possibly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, you don't want to get that hacked. So that's kind of, uh, you know, plus you've got a GDPR nightmare, impending nightmare to, to, to consider, which is going to be uh, just this data protection regulation introduced by the EU that's going to kick in mid-2018. So if you get your data hacked and responsible, there are harsh, harsh penalties. 20 million euros. Huh? Yeah, oh, 20 million euros or 4% yeah. uh, global uh, uh, turnover. And if you are hacked, you've got to report it within 24 hours. And anyone who's hacked uh, <coughs> is entitled to sue the company. So, for example, TalkTalk, if the GDPR had been enforced, I think they would have been fined around 300 million. My concern is that a lot of early stage technology companies are, who, of course, will be planning to deal with data with consent and permission of their customers. Um, if they slip up and they're hacked, it could take down the company. Or they try to raise money and a VC will say, well, how, if we invest in your company, can you guarantee you're not going to fall foul of the, the GDPR? Well, that of course, they can't enough. offer 100% guarantee. That seems fair enough. I mean, what seems fair enough? Very important that uh, companies actually take this as uh, very, very serious. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. And if it takes legislation, no, they haven't. Top Top didn't take it seriously. I mean, Top Top had been hacked two, three years before and been notified that they had been hacked and they did nothing about it. So, you know, they should have been fined, whatever. Um, you know, and so other companies... Yeah, but to take down a company, I think, is a bit harsh. And what you're going to do is you're going to have a hacktivists targeting companies to intentionally hack them and take them down. And there are certain companies who will be so, uh, I think, badly affected that they will potentially go out of business or it'll severely damage them because they're targeted. The mm. So I think it's um, I think that it's too draconian and it's going to it is designed to put the fear uh, into Facebook, Google and Amazon. But those guys are untouchable so it's not going to affect them at all. The ones I think are going to be affected are SMEs, <coughs> charities, government institutions, family owned businesses and startups are going to be very vulnerable. So no, yeah, I'm not a fan. Yeah, yeah, customers will be But I suspect there'll be a reasonable defense. So, you know, if you've got reasonable security yes. at some level, yeah. then you'll be okay, that'll be defense. But yeah. you've got to have that reasonable and, and yeah. putting the fear of God into people so they have yeah, that reasonable. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, post Brexit, the UK I don't uh, will anyway. probably become a safe harbor. There's always a good part around these things. Anyhow. So rather than a debate, I love a good debate, you know what I'm like, <laughs> go on all night long. We do actually have three speakers to get through, so um, are you ready? Everything set up? Yep. So could we have a round of, oh, sorry, no other? Uh, uh, just one quick one, sorry. Um, so my name's Rob, um, I'm from the Technology Wi-Fi, so we're the guys behind the free public Wi-Fi network um, in Edinburgh, so currently we cover around 
think it's about a mile and a half square yeah, um, in the city centre. Uh, we have a number of kind of um, key areas of network hardware deployed throughout the city centre, and we're quite open to conversations around anybody that might want to sit on that network. Um, it's an open kind of platform as such in terms of conversation. So, if anyone wants to grab us afterwards, uh, feel free to do so. Sounds good. Excellent. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you so much to our speakers and to our sponsors. Um, uh, Edinburgh Uni, uh, Matic. So our first speaker, are you ready? Okay, excellent. So back to you, Edinburgh Uni. So you are your uh, PhD in Edinburgh Uni? Yes, I'm PhD. 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 Thank you, Simon. Thank you, David, for putting together the event, uh, both of you, of course. And today I'm going to talk about my research, which is covering uh, contact detection using uh, mobile devices, uh, primarily with smartphones. You all carry it in your pocket. And I know this is a very dividing topic. We had uh, previous yes, meetups where we were uh, raising awareness of But at the same time, we cannot neglect the benefits that we get by uh, taking advantage or leveraging uh, the sensor data we can collect with our devices. So I hope that my research is going to bring a bridge between these two aspects. So, yeah, a few key takeaways from this presentation would be that sensor on smartphones and wearable devices in general are. Um, uh, Useful to detect very complex uh, user, uh, uh, very complex user context, <clears throat> and some of the context that I'm going to talk about are uh, indoor localization, indoor outdoor detection, and activity recognition. And finally, I'm going to conclude with a vision of uh, how context detection can be used in real world applications. Okay, but a first quiz for you guys. This is uh, the representation, the signal of uh, acceleration from a smartphone. Do you know what um, activities this represents? Is it running, jogging, walking? It's walking, yes. Yeah. The bus? Is it? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's actually walking, indeed. What about in this case? And uh, don't think just the activities themselves. It can also be the signal received from other uh, interactions around the users, other physical phenomena. So, do you know what this one is? Is it volume, noise? No, no, it's the uh, signal from accelerometer. Oh. So car? Car? Yeah, no, close. So, so it is indeed a so transportation go. vehicle? No. Uh, oh, like bicycle? Nope, no. It's not going to be the elevator. Exactly, the transportation mode. When the elevator starts going down, you have a descending peak of the acceleration when the elevator stops, or the lift is going to When the lift starts moving and it reaches a constant speed here, so it first accelerates, in this case, it decelerates because it's going downwards, and then coming to a constant speed while moving between floors. So looking at the distance between the peaks, you can actually determine the number of floors that are used as a travel. And of course, you can have it, yes, so it's the elevator going down, and you can have it in the opposite direction when the elevator is going up. Uh, there are a lot of noises when, there's a lot of noise when the elevator starts moving, but that be easily filtered out. <coughs> this is the raw signal uh, from the accelerometer. Okay, what about in this case? This, to give you a hint, it's actually when the user is climbing stairs, going up and going down. But do you know which one is the top one? <coughs> that one. <laughs> so is this going it's when the user is climbing? Yeah. And this one is when the user is climbing down, going down the stairs. Well, to be honest, I don't know that myself either. <laughs> but apparently, there's enough information in the signal for a computer to uh, accurately detect which one is which. 
So yeah, in this case, it's when the user is going up to your right, <coughs> and this one when the, uh, the user carrying the phone is climbing down the stairs. Okay, but the final quiz, the, the last one, and I promise it's the last quiz. Do you know which, uh, which activity this one is? It's a bit more complex. <coughs> Hand gliding? No. Bungee <laughs> jumping? What if I add the next extra signal? This would be the heading of the user. You can see it starting from, uh, you can detect this with the magnetometer and it's the orientation of the user starting from 150 degrees, then uh, rotating to 250 and then coming back. Is it driving? driving? No. It's actually the activity of going into a room when rotating around the door. And the user is. So you can see you can get more quality by adding additional signals. So not collecting just the accelerometer signal, but also looking at the heading and the orientation of uh, the phone while the user is performing those activities. OK, that's enough with the quiz. Now to get into the real business. Uh, quick background about uh, indoor localization or look location altogether, so how it started. Even from the old days, people wanted to know their position. Uh, they wanted to know their how to get back uh, from hunting, for instance, or they wanted to know their uh, position in the universe, so they started mapping uh, uh, the stars on the sky and how the Earth uh, rotates around the stars. So we've always had the tendency to uh, map our uh, surroundings. So cartography started actually 1,500 years ago. We don't know if it's exactly when it started, but that's the oldest uh, map we have nowadays. So it represents the city of uh, Nippur in Babylon. And you can see here the river flowing or the walls of the city and some structures, uh, uh, physical structures on the map. So it's clear to say that it's, uh, it's safe to say that we've always had this tendency of localizing ourselves. But before the GPS era, how was navigation done outdoors? With, starting with Navtech in 1985, and Fred here confirmed the information that I dig up, uh, being uh, one of the first employees of the company, they started uh, digitally mapping uh, the environment for navigating inside of a car. They, they were basing their uh, information on a gyroscope plus compass system that would estimate the orientation of the car uh, and also a way of measuring the distance that the car is traveling. And in that case, you would get corner by corner orientation in the city. For instance, if you wanted to travel from the airport to the hotel, you would get this information printed out uh, at the airport and they will give you indication of how to reach your destination. Imagine going into a new city and not having no, uh, any other source of information. And another important aspect is they, they were also collecting some reference points, um, usually by uh, image description. This means that they would add additional uh, information kind of like you have a coffee shop on your right or a shopping mall to your left so you don't get lost. Uh, so it, uh, occasionally you would want to reassure yourself that you're on the right track. This is an important concept because I'm going to come back uh, uh, to it later when I talk about indoor localization. But in, nowadays mapping it's easy with Google Maps. They have a simple interface and they also provide location based on Wi-Fi fingerprinting. So, it's safe to say that it's not very accurate. It has a range of around 40 meters. This is actually the informatic form, the building that we are in right now. So you cannot actually tell where in the room you might be, which of the room. With 40 meters, you can be anywhere in the building. So imagine the scenario where you want to navigate through the aisles of a of a store, a uh, supermarket, you want to find sugar or, uh, or aisle 5, for instance. Sorry. Uh, using Google Maps, that's currently not possible. Or the same situation could be with uh, finding a book 
book on the shelves in a library. So what solutions do we have to get past the uh, to get even greater accuracy for localization? We have two current solutions, pedestrian and reckoning, and I think I'm very uh, going to describe what they both mean. So pedestrian dead reckoning, you start from a known location and with a way of estimating the heading, the direction of movement of the user. This could be either from the compass because it's accurately grounded in the earth reference uh, frame and also assisted with the gyroscope, <coughs> uh, you can accurately get this uh, estimation. And also finding a way to uh, estimate the distance that the user is traveling. If you remember, the activity of user walking represents kind of like a sinusoidal signal. So you could easily impose a function on that. So count how many times the signal go past zero, and that will represent uh, each time a user is performing a step. And having access to these two estimations, you can uh, estimate the consecutive position and perform the same uh, inference, you would have continuous estimation of the <coughs> location. So if it's that simple, you would just start easily from this point, travel in a straight line, and end up at the corner. But in reality, it's not that simple. This is what you usually get in practice. And that is because you have additional interferences in the environment. In this case, you see a high radiation, which is caused by a magnetic door in, that, in this position. Uh, this has the effect of deviating the compass, and even if you combine it with the gyroscope, so fusing the two sensors together, the gyroscope is uh, reliable on short periods of time, but it also accumulates error. The sampling is not always perfect, and it, you, it's, you can think of the gyroscope as being a similar, similar process with uh, that reckoning. You build on top of previous estimations, and once you introduce small errors, those tend to build up, and your estimation goes way off. Um, from the right uh, trajectory. Okay, so what would be the solutions in this case? Relying on, as we were uh, mentioning earlier, you can uh, detect the user's activity. So knowing where the position of the elevators are and the stairs, you can use those reference points uh, to recalibrate the user's position. So <coughs> determining when the user is performing particular activ activities that are accurately localizable on the map you can recalibrate the user's position occasionally. And also relying on Wi-Fi fingerprinting. A very short description of what this means is when you have your phone scanning the Wi-Fi environment, that environment it can determine the access points that you see around you and the signal strength that they're received by the phone. And <clears throat> you can imagine we're um, collecting a lot of uh, measurements from uh, exhaustively in this case, you would just go cell by cell and get the exact measurements of all those positions and thus creating a database of Wi-Fi fingerprint location uh,
and at throughout the time you just compare your current observations with the uh, data database, thus finding out the, uh, the location where the user might be. I'm getting very much into technical details here, but uh, I'm going to leave this description. If you're interested, you can find it in the paper. Uh, you can find everything is available on my website, Open Access. But a very quick description of what it does, and combining all the sensors with activity recognition and knowledge of where those landmarks are in the building, uh, as well as Wi-Fi fingerprinting, uh, combined with uh, particle sensors to get a single estimation, which is more reliable than uh, those.
Has everybody got a seat? Uh, good evening everyone, welcome to the, the February uh, blockchain, Scottish blockchain meetup. It's good to see a full turnout again uh, from everybody. So uh, I'd just like to thank Portgrace for hosting us this evening. And we've also got, we're live streaming, oh sorry, we're live streaming on YouTube. So everyone on Best Behaviour, uh, thanks to Product Forge for doing that for us at the back. Um, and also well, tonight, I think, we're, I think hopefully everyone agrees we've got a good line up. Um, we'll start you off with, um, we've got a lot of different uh, varied levels of blockchain knowledge, so, so the feedback we've been getting, a lot of people are keen to see kind of blockchain 101, the basics and the understanding. I know we've got a, a lot of experts here as well, so hopefully um, it's not too boring for you guys. But uh, I'd like to welcome the first speaker tonight, so Greg Paul from Strathclyde University. Um, Greg is a mobile and cyber security and blockchain specialist, um, so I'll hand you over time for blockchain 101. Thank you. Thank you. That's me. Turn it on. So that's me. I'm a cybersecurity research engineer. That's the job title, apparently. Uh, I work in digital security, cryptography, decentralized systems, mobile security, blockchain, etc. You get the idea. All these kinds of things. It's interesting stuff. Um, let me see. So I just going to quickly check my notes. Yeah, all, all these kinds of things, I don't know, I like to do other stuff as well. But uh, I'm going to talk today about blockchain and give you a quick introduction to Blockchain 101. And I always like to start with a myth or a hype, you know, hype and myth. Same thing. So there's a myth that Bitcoin invented blockchain. It's quite a prevalent one, it's quite a pervasive one, but actually it's not true. The first blockchain actually came about in 2005. Bitcoin was 2009. It was uh, hash chains that we used to verify software source code. If you're a developer, it's called Git. Git uses a blockchain internally. You'll just not see it really. That's what the hashes are in your commits. And the second myth is that Bitcoins are untraceable because you know they're this evil cryptographic currency that is completely untraceable and you can do all sorts of you know disgusting and unspeakable things with it. So it makes a really good headline, but the fact of the matter is, it's pretty easy to trace. So it's me just tracing some Bitcoins. Uh, I think those numbers are actually measured in <coughs> thousands. So 17,000 means 17 million. That's just tracing large amounts of money around Bitcoin. It's traceable. It doesn't tell you who it was, but we can come back later once we know who an address is owned by, you know, because they've had their house searched and you can find out exactly what they've been up to. And you can never delete the records because, hey, Bitcoin is completely irreversible. So every transaction is visible forever. That's a big important property of Bitcoin. And it's one to keep in mind, but it's also a fundamental principle of blockchain. So all the funds can be traced to their creation. And we'll talk more about what the actual properties of blockchain are. But this is just something to keep in mind. It doesn't directly really help you identify who's involved. But once you figure them out, you know exactly what they've done. So what is blockchain? Obviously, we've got a lot of people here who know what blockchain is, hopefully. But there's also a few people who don't. So let's have a quick look. Fundamentally, yeah, not a joke, it's a chain of blocks. It sounds simple, but let's just see. So there's no maths. I did say in the introduction thing on the website, there would be no maths. I stand by the promise. There will be no maths. First thing we need to know about cryptographic hashes. Again, no maths. It's a number and it represents a fingerprint of the data. It's like a one-way function. So if you get something that's easy to do one way, but difficult to do the other way, then that's pretty good. So for example, if I ask you to multiply two numbers, that's pretty easy to do. But if I give you a big number and ask you what two numbers are multiplied to get to it, you're going to have some trouble doing that. It's really quite difficult to go the other way. And that's a one-way function. You can't reverse it to find the input. A tiny change to the input is also going to completely change the output. Let's take a look. So here's an example. I've got a message. I've got a hash. Don't worry what the hash is. It's just random data. That's fine. I'm going to change the message really slightly, just a little tiny bit, and the hash changes completely. So now what I'm going to do is change the name. And again, it changes completely because we've now got a different hash because every message has a different hash. But if I give you a hash, does anyone want to guess what that says? What's the, what's the input to that hash? Come on, I've showed you three. Anyone want to take a guess? Well, it's not. Because actually, it's blockchain meetup anyway. Point is, you can't go backwards. If I give you this, it's very difficult to go backwards. It's a computationally difficult problem to actually go backwards. And that's useful. Because that means we can burst. We're going to have more than one thing to do. We're going to have more than one message to convey. 
So here's a message. So Alice bought item X from Bob for 10 pounds. All we're gonna do is we're gonna put the hash of the previous block in at the bottom of this block. And we get the hash of this transaction, here it is. Now we're gonna take the next thing that's gonna happen, this is gonna be the next one. So David has agreed a contract with Charlie or something else. And we're gonna put the previous block's hash in at the bottom over here. That's the same as that. We're putting in the hash of the last block into the next block. By doing this, we can start to form a chain. So let's just think what's actually inside that block. That's a really simple example there. But in a block, in Bitcoin, we have one or more transactions. In a more general sense, it's a group of events or records. So when you've got more than one thing happening, you can use that. A record of events, just anything you want to put in the chain. If you get something you want to put in the blockchain, that should event in your record. So let's build a tree. Here's a tree. I built one earlier. So what we've got here is each block is linked to the next, because each block contains the hash of the previous block. And what that means is if we verify the block at the top with its hash, and that contains the hash of this block, but this block contains the hash of this block. And we all agreed earlier that we can't easily just change the input to a hash and get something different out. That actually lets us verify everything that comes before it. So if we store just that, we can verify the entire history. So just the hash of the top block is all we need to, to be able to verify everything that happened before it. And you can publish that, you can write it in a newspaper, you can put it on the internet as much as you want, you can tell everyone it, you can put it on a banner and hang it up in Edinburgh Castle if you want. People can verify it and be sure that what they're seeing is exactly what everyone else sees. So if we had a distributed public ledger, it's a ledger that everyone can participate in, that's all over the place, there's no one spot that it resides in. Everybody can see the transactions and the operations that have taken place, but they can also now verify it. So when you make a transaction, and put something and you want something put into a block in Bitcoin. Let's take a look at what happens. First thing is you transmit that to the internet through your local network. So it goes through your network to the internet, and once it gets to the internet, magic happens, and it heads along the pipes to the other computers, the other networks that are on the internet, and once it gets there, it heads off to some other computers that participate in the Bitcoin network. And once it's here, they all can see your transaction. Your transaction has now reached all the other participants of the network, and that's really important because what it means is they can all see what's happened. And that means there's no privacy in what's happened on Bitcoin. Everyone has to be able to see it for it to be valid. So let's talk about Bitcoin, a case study. It sounds boring, I just wrote that to make it sound boring. Actually it's not, okay? So this is what we think when we see Bitcoins. Now, there are actually no coins, not even digital coins. There is no concept of a coin in Bitcoin. Bitcoin is all about bank transfers. If there's no bank. But you get so when you transfer money in Bitcoin, you're actually not taking a coin and moving it around. You're just taking an amount of funds and transferring it to another person. So there are no coins, just keep it in mind. People think that Bitcoin works by making the transaction with this. So you take an amount here from this and you pay it here, an amount here and you pay it from this. But they don't think about what happens before it. You know, the idea here is that Bob is one Bitcoin, he pays 0.3 over there to Alice. And he pays 0.7 back to himself. And, uh, traditionally, this is done using the GPS on the on the phone, but as we found out, this is not always very reliable. Uh, the mark zone represents indoors, whereas the white represents out, represents outdoor. So we have a situation where the signal from the GPS is received inside of a building, whereas outdoors, when you are in areas with very tall building called the urban canyons, you won't receive a good signal, and that's how the system can, uh, can get confused, it's not very really accurate. And at the same time, it's a very uh, energy expensive sensor. You probably know if you left them just on, uh, on Google Maps and drain your battery very, very fast. What about reliance? New labels for, uh, for the system, which means that you can have the system continuously training itself. And our performance was in the 90% accuracy of uh, surpassing all the other um, uh, systems before us. Cool. <clears throat> and the last, uh, the last context um, that I'm going to talk about is activity recognition, but this time using a different architecture. Uh, this is based on uh, deep learning and we're using uh, two modalities in parallel, in this case, accelerometer and gyroscope. 
Uh, so you, with a uh, deep neural network on each of the modalities, you would extract preliminary uh, features, which can then be combined to come up with a single estimation. So it's, our observation is that pre-selecting those features <coughs> by the network independently on each of the sensing modalities is more efficient than just putting the data all together into a single architecture. That is because uh, one of the sensors may dominate the other and you miss out important information from, uh, uh, from, from each of the sensors if you don't uh, uh, allow it enough space to extract its own features. Valentin, a couple more minutes. Okay, yes, yeah. I'm getting close. Okay, good. Okay. Just very fast, the evaluation for this system. Well, we had the large data set, nine participants, each of them were performing six activities with uh, eight devices and we surpassed as the previous uh, classifiers. Ours was in the 80%. Uh, you may say this is very low, but actually the training was done for, uh, with a method of leaving one of the participants out and training on the rest. So this resembles kind of like a fresh, uh, fresh system for the other um, uh, user. Imagine you're developing an application and you want to release it and be used by a lot of users. Uh, so you don't have label data from all the other users. <coughs> but the observation is that if you specialize the network on the users later on, you can reach 90 to, uh, 95 to 97% accuracy on those users with less than five minutes of um, additional training data. Okay, the energy efficiency we evaluated with the development board, the Snapdragon the, the, the process are very similar to the one you have in smartwatches and the older generation of smartphones, yeah, just to have full control over the measurements. And what we found was the impact of energy consumption on a battery, um, on a typical battery on, on a smartphone is less than 1.2% uh, of the whole battery for this sort of inferences and sensor sampling, just because the <coughs> sensors are uh, much, much cheaper than the GPS and all the other sensors. Okay, so we're getting close to conclusions. Uh, why is this important? It's a, uh, we have a debate nowadays that uh, moving our data <coughs> into the cloud and helping the other, uh, our services is beneficial to us, but with such a system you have everything under control. You pro uh, produce the data uh, locally and you also consume it locally with specialized uh, context detection algorithms. In this case you don't need to transfer a lot of a large volume of data to the cloud. So you have nowadays uh, the problem with Amazon Alexa, the police is trying to get access to their uh, to voice data from one of their users uh, in California because of a crime scenario. So you can actually see how harmful, harmful it can be to send your personal data to the cloud. But performing all the inferences locally avoids all these problems while still taking advantage of uh, uh, useful inferences to, to, to assist you throughout the day. <coughs> okay, so the vision is that Many inferences will be performed locally on mobile devices and wearable, so we'll have more and more of such inferences happening on our devices. The default setting should be off for uploading the data. Everything should happen locally to the device. If you want to improve the, the algorithms and the architecture, the deep neural network architecture, then you'll have to give some incentive to the users to upload their data. That can be cash or discounts next time you're uh, selling them something. Uh, think of uh, bus companies, uh, they'll give you a discount next time you're purchasing a bus ticket. Finally, you're not going home. Arrangements to prepare or signal your house to put on romantic music and turn on the lights. At the same time, you can also instruct your personal uh, robot to start cooking your favorite meal to be ready uh, once you arrive at home. So I'm going to leave you with this question. What interesting and useful context detection can we think of to improve our life? Something that can happen on the phone with the sensors we have available for that. Thank you. Oh, sorry, before that.
I need to acknowledge my collaborators, my supervisor Mahesh Marina, Lito, Yuta, Rick, Nick, Surav, and Cecilia. That's it. Great, round of applause. So, this is actually the power okay, of the network and the community of action. I had a friend who's an entrepreneur. Um, what do you call those things when you go, you're like groups of teams and you go on a hunt to look for things and you get a great gift? Scavenger hunt. Scavenger hunt, exactly. And he said, I want to do a treasure hunt with mobile phones. So it's not the most you know, original idea, but his question was, how on earth do you do very targeted localized indoor GPS? I don't know, Google it. Now, how many times have you been coming to the IoT meetups and how long have we known each other? I had no idea that's what you did. You are literally a domain expert in that field, right? So if, you, if there's someone who knows about indoor GPS for this particular idea or any application, you know, you're the go-to guy. So that is the power of the network. It's just spreading that information and, you know, getting referrals and, and uh, There's a company in Glasgow that's got a Wi-Fi map of all the Wi-Fi stations in the world, you know it? They're not the company, but they're a few. Yeah, no, this is a company that they, they, they put an app out that allows you to track all the Wi-Fi's, but they suck all the data back, and they've got a map of all the Wi-Fi's in the world. So, before we go to our next speaker, the other comment is, for me it's quite difficult to know exactly how to pitch the, the level of, of, of you know, technicality um, and you know, there are times at which I can see half the room literally kind of going, oh, God. You know, when they see something too technical and then the other side of the room lights up, you know, lean in, oh my God, technical, brilliant. Um, and I think what I'll try to do is mix it up, maybe have one slightly more technical, one more strategic, and one slightly make it kind of practical, um, just to try to keep everyone happy. But it's impossible really to know how technical to go. And I think your, you struck a really good balance because I was able to follow it. And, and you know, in itself, that's quite, quite a challenge. Um, and I also think that there are a lot of highly technical, very niche meetups out there that cater quite well for that, like Tech Meetup, for example, that's at uh, Skyscanner each month, isn't it? And then it's probably the Pipe and the C++ and the Java meetup groups. So I think, like I said, they're very highly technical and very well catered for, which is why I tend to prefer to just steer clear of getting too deeply technical and start you know, going through lines of code and so on. So I thought yours, uh, your talk was excellent and it was a really interesting balance. So well done. Thank you so much. Right, let's have a little uh, brief uh, break. Guys, go and grab a drink and a snack. We're just going to configure and set up for the next speaker. Literally just two minutes, just two minutes. Just keep the momentum going because we've got a third speaker. Right. So yeah.
We've got Sergio Senna, who's going to talk about unicorn seals. Is that a unicorn seal? <laughs> All right. Oh, give her the live stream, Alan. Find out the technical glitches. Come on, Patrick. Right. So our next speaker is, uh, as I mentioned, is Sergio Senna. Now you've come all the way from St. Andrews, is that right? Yeah. And you had a little bit of a nightmare getting here, is that right? Okay. That's true. Perhaps you can start by, by explaining what yeah. a, so, um, a hero you were to make it all the way down from St. Andrews. Uh, let's have a round of applause. Thank you. So I've, I've spent, before showing you the presentation, I've spent the last three days up north, in the farthest point of Scotland, in Terzo, uh, on a field trip, um, checking the new, the new sites for our base stations. I'll show you some pictures, and I have a video. I don't know if we have audio. Uh, the audio will just give you wind, because that's how bad the conditions were up there. So, um, um, so who am I? Um, I've been an um, electronics designer for 15 plus years. I've done many things uh, within digital processors, animal power. And um, since I started working with sensors, radio, and trying to put things on the internet going back from 2009, I've always tried to do everything very low power. At the time, maybe before the a bit before that, people were, were much interested in, in going low power because we have big batteries. But now everything is uh, everything is portable. Everyone wants the batteries to last ten years, and uh, that, that got uh, about interested in that. So past lives, I've I built robot <coughs> vacuum cleaners, smart meters, and I was also a, a lecturer. Done many things. Uh, for those that are on radio operators, I am Charlie Tango 2, Golf Papa Whiskey. You can talk at the end about this. <laughs> so, I've come from the University of St. Andrews. Um, there's a, a research unit called CIMAMO Research Unit. And so, who is and what does the CIMAMO Research Unit do? So, it was established uh, in 78 by NERC the Natural Environment Research Council, and the SMRU has 40 people between uh, academics, researchers, and student staff, and mainly it's marine biology research. Um, it was in Cambridge, uh, 96 moved to St. Andrews. Uh, it's part of the Scottish Oceans Institute that is part of the University of St. Andrews. It's an independent, independent research group, so um, part of NERC and supplies advice to, you, to the UK government on all things marine. Okay, so, yeah, last year, 2000, say late 2015, early 2016, we established a partnership, a strategic partnership with Vodafone UK for the M2M. And you understand, you will understand why M to M, machine to machine. Um, after I show you uh, what we do at the instrumentation group. So the instrumentation group is a group of ten people. We have thirty years experience designing uh, electronics. Uh, we design, build, test, and commission tags. You've seen that seal, that picture of the seal with uh, with an antenna on the head. I will show you what what that is. So we design. Hardware, firmware, software, mechanical, we do the assembly, encapsulation, potting, and we do the field test. So from the initial idea until we send the tags to the researchers to the field, that will go everywhere, everywhere on Earth 
and seas, we do it. We're not the only ones, but we are very well positioned when we are working in a niche environment and we are top of the group. Uh, as I said, tags work on all continents and sea. We are proud of that um, and we can corroborate this. Our tags withstand from minus 25 to 40 degrees. Remember, if they work on, in the, on the tropics, we are talking about 40. If they work in the, in the poles, uh, when the animals are out of the water, we have to withstand at least minus 25 degrees. 200 bar, and that's 2,000 meters depth. The tags have to withstand that pressure because some of the animals, some seals, some whales go at that depth, to that depth. And, of course, between 3 to 12 months operation, some of the tags sometimes uh, work on a multi-year, special for turtles if we have solar charging uh, on our tags. And between 3 to 12 months, and it depends on how many points per day or per week or per month you want, if you want acceleration data, if you want GPS data. So the more points, the more information you want, the less battery you will have because you have to transmit more power or you have to log more times, more frequently. Okay, so what kind of technology do, you, do we use? We use extremely low power digital and analog electronics. Everything is designed by us in-house. Um, for transmitting the data, we use GSM GPRS. We use Argo satellite. I'm sorry, can you see this? Yeah. 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 yeah, back there? Okay, thank you. We use Argo Satellite. Argo Satellite is a network of, if I'm not mistaken, six or seven birds flying uh, above, above the Earth um, in 401 megahertz. Um, you have Argos 2 that is only a beacon, only for transmission, and you have Argos 3 that you have a transmission and you have between one to three seconds uh, a reception like a mailbox. So we work with both. We have uh, UHF propriety and now we are using LoRa. And I mean LoRa and not LoRa 1, okay? That's, that's, a, that's a big difference. And we are prototyping already. We narrow band IoT um, and we've been sponsored with, uh, on these by Vodafone. And we are prototyping also with Iridium so we can uh, have, oops, I'm sorry. We have um, a bigger bandwidth uh, than Argos because with Argos satellite we can transmit 32 bytes every three minutes, and, and most of the time the satellite doesn't see it because it has only a 10% efficiency. So we are talking about a six or seven birds flowing, and you have to be really lucky that your transmission gets to that satellite. So 10% efficiency. Uh, but very low power though. It's very, very low power. Iridium, iridium it's high power, high bandwidth, so as a trade-off. Depends on the work you want to do. Some work you can withstand the power, uh, other work you, you cannot, so it depends. Uh, we have solar energy and battery charging with very low power um, solar cells and uh, very low power circuitry. We use fast lock geolocation and fast lock, it's not a GPS. GPS, as you know it, it takes some time to grab a position, a few seconds, sometimes 30 seconds, one minute, and that is a lot of power. It's always in constant uh, grabbing. Fast lock reads the sky for 50 milliseconds and then post process all data for 12, 15 seconds and gives you how many satellites are there in the sky and gives you the strength of each satellite. Then you transmit that to the, to the server, and then uh, on the server we calculate where the animal was. So instead of spending several seconds with a lot of, with a lot of power being um, wasted, because for, for us it's wasted, we spend 15 milliseconds of high power receiving the radio, and then post-processing with DSP and FPGA on board uh, all the data. Also, we have conductivity, temperature, and depth me measurements, and high precision definition and repetitivity. 
We have fluorometry and tags, high precision light meters, down to the number of electrons. Yes, we can calculate the number of electrons. At two kilometers depth, the number of electrons can be counted. And for that, we use a kind of light sensor uh, built from a Japanese company, Hamamatsu. It's the best light sensors that are on the market, and we calibrate, it, we calibrate them in house. And uh, we can give you the number of electrons for, on that time frame. Some researchers want that because at two kilometers depth, you don't have any light for us, but some animals can detect the photons. Other sensors that are here are accelerometers, uh, gyroscopes, and magnetometers. We use all that too. Okay, so what you see here, it's an old generation tag built with an 8 bit processor, still an old design from the 80s. These, these tags, we're still shipping them and selling them until we finish our new generation. Um, with, the note, with this processor, I think it was an Itachi Renesis processor, we can't do much in terms of sleeping. If you want to do something, uh, the CPU has to be awakened, that means power wastage, and even for a small job as counting timers, everything needs to be awake. That's a very power wastage. So, in a sleep mode, we waste around 10 microamps, you say 10 microamps is nothing, but for us, we can fly to the moon with 10 microns. It's, it's a lot of power. Because uh, remember that these tags need to, be sleep, need to be asleep all the time. Once in a while, seconds or minutes, tag wakes up for real-time clock or for a transmission or for a sensor gravity. So the average needs to be much lower than this. And the leakage, the leakage of these circuits, it's, since this is a, an old circuitry, the leakage is very, very high in terms of the components used, because they are all components, uh, too much capacity on the board, so there's a lot of leakage. Uh, new generation. Uh, I'll show you later, uh, the next slide, a comparison between both tags, so you can see the, 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 the differences. Uh, we're using now a 32-bit ARM Cortex-M4 with DSP instructions. So most of the things that we were using, uh, the older tags that took seconds to do, now we do it in a fraction of a second. Um, the good thing about the, this new technology is that all the peripherals inside the, CPU, the, the, the processor can work while the CPU is sleeping, so everyone can exchange data, work, stop, start, stop, start, stop, exchange data, and the CPU is asleep and is stopped. And that means great power savings, because if the CPU is stopped, uh, there is no extra power wastage. Uh, we have an average between 20 to 50 nanoamp sleeping if we shut down everything on the board. And our main consumption is below one microamp, including the leakages and everything. But we need to shut down everything on the board except the processor running uh, real-time clock. Okay, so you see the differences between the old and the new. Um, it's more than twice the reduction in size. There is always a trade-off between the size of the battery and, of course, the longevity of your tag. If you want a tag to last between 9 to 12 months, there is no choice. You have to choose a, diff, uh, a, um, a larger battery. If you want a tag that will give you information for between 1 to 3 months, you can go on a very short, uh, sorry, sorry, very smaller battery, but still you don't have the longevity. So it's, a, it's always a trade-off. Uh, looking at the technology inside, that's the old board, that's the new board. If we rotate this board 90 degrees clockwise, it's more or less three times uh, one third of the size, I'm sorry. And there's still a lot of space there. And 
you can also change the design. There's a, a GSM GPRS modems and all many connectors for other sensors. Roughly how big is that, just in terms of scale? Um, yeah, that I should have put a coin there. It's <laughs> uh, we're talking about three centimeters by six centimeters. Okay, it's still small but large. For some animals, it's still large because if you add the battery, it's, it's a bigger size there. But trade-offs. Okay, so in terms of IoT. Internet of Things. Um, we start developing with LoRa in late 2015. Uh, we've done we, our first field tests in February 2016, that was a year ago. And the first tests were very su successful. Uh, we tested, we went to the market and grabbed the modules that were available, connected to our tags built the base station, put the antennas on the roof, we done all that. So, um, we got 99% packet delivery uh, over 12 kilometers and near line of sight. And when I mean, mean near line of sight is that the receiving station was blocked by tall buildings and that was it. After those tall buildings there was there, there is a big there's, I don't know if you know, um, San Andreas, uh, it's called West Sands. It's a very large bay, really shallow. There's nothing in, in, in between. So with the power that the module gave, gave us, 14 dBm or 35 milliwatts, we got a 90% packet delivery. And it was, um, we confirmed it because we always put the tags on, on, the, on the sun. That's our test because the animals, when they haul out on the beach, they are always on, on the sand. They are not standing like us. They are lying down. So we had to put everything on the sand and do the testings. We tested several antennas, PCB patches, PCB um, copper ducts or vertical antennas, small. And even with that antenna, and that is one centimeter by two centimeters, we got. 99% packet delivery. And we're talking an antenna that it's a negative gain. Okay. Uh, the base station has a very good antenna, plus 11 dBi. Okay, and it's the building, uh, the roof of the building is at around 20 meters above the sea level. It's not optimum, especially because you can see here the roof. The antenna is really close to the roof. The roof is metallic, so there, there's still a bit of a loss. And these were the tests one year ago. That's, that's me holding the, you know, everything with wires. And it was working. So after these first tests, we, we went on and built uh, a real system. So that's San Andreas here. The, our institute is here on the beach. And we got, we went to Tensmute Beach at the time, and we got around 12 kilometers near line of sight from one point to the other. Okay, so what's been doing, what's been uh, done now? We have beta testings uh, since last year, and we will have uh, another group of beta testings in April uh, 2017. I've been up north, as I told you, um, checking, checking the sites for the new base stations. Uh, there's a new tag design being launched and being put on, 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 on the seals. Um, have a, it has been designed centered just on LoRa. Okay, so we decided that we wanted to use LoRa for our um, UHF tags, and we designed the tag, I designed the tag around that, that concept. Um, and this is all to prove that the base station is uh, up to the task, that the tags are up to the task, and so we can release version number one. It's still everything in beta, but it's, it's still working. So, new tag. Uh, some of you probably, if you follow me on Twitter or Facebook, have already seen this photo. This is the same size, three centimeters by 
six centimeters as our arm protects uh, our arm protects with DSP instructions. Uh, one gigabit flash memory to log um, all the information from GPS and sensors if it cannot talk with the base station. Okay, some of, some animals spend a few days at sea away from the base station, so they need to save all all data. That data is really important to the to the researchers. Uh, our LoRa radio, we chose a module uh, on the market um, for this attempt and to, to, to test of the, the LoRa system. Revision number one will have the chips and the chips, uh, the radio chips, and not the, the module for convenience. It also has a fast lock geograbber kind kind of GPS. It has also a conductivity, temperature, and depth sensor with an extra depth sensor. Wet dry sensors are sensors that detect when the animal is in and out of the water. So it's important that we transmit only when the animal is uh, out of the water. And this has a lot of power conditioning circuitry and also circuitry to disconnect everything that is not needed on the board. So when the animal goes into the water, we can disconnect all the radios, all the sensors that are wasting power. So everything is off. And there's also a magnetic switch because everything will be encapsulated in epoxy. There are no electrical connections, no buttons, nothing. So using a magnet, <coughs> we give controls to the tag, switch on, switch off. Um, combinations of switches, of magnets, we can do some programming. So that's one of the ways we, we found that works. So that's, that's the base station where it is now operating in East Sands in San Andrews. It's been there since February last year. Uh, working well. That's part of the of the of the PCB inside for the people that like to see it. Yeah. <laughs> so it's also an ARM Cortex M4 has SD card for logging all all the tags that connect with it. Uh, the LoRa radio is the same radio that's on the tags, so full compatibility. Um, It has GSM and GPRS to talk with our servers directly, so when there are enough um, tags, I mean, when, when enough tags have talked to the, to the, to the base station and we have uh, an amount of data, there's a connection by GPRS, FTP, or HTTP post to our servers, download data. Also power conditioning and power switches for everything on the board. Uh, it has mains power, it can be powered by mains, it can be powered by solar panel, it can be powered by battery, and the solar panel and the mains charge the batteries. It has USB uh, connections for a console outside or for downloading data. There's a user interface with LCD buttons for if, for if the researcher goes on the field, opens the, opens the, opens the box presses the button, see what, what's going on, you can see traffic, you can see all the tags that are talking. You can take the SD card, substitute the SD card, or just press the button and send all the information that it's still on the SD card back to the server. Future development for revision to add Ethernet, Ethereum, and make it portable. It's already mobile. It's not portable, it's mobile, because you have tripods, and that's not much, much portable because you know, it's still weight. So these photos were taken two days ago, you, so you, you can see where we use our stuff. That's first generation base station. That's one of my colleagues. And that's their top northwest point two days ago before the storm. <laughs> so today is the 23rd. Yesterday, 22nd, we went back to the, to the sites again and we couldn't 
walk we some um, mm. twice we had to lie on the floor because the wind was so strong that yeah any questions So we'll keep the Q&A brief. I know Rob always has questions because we're going to do the panel Q&A at the end. So just make it quick and then we'll do the kind of open Q&A thing. Um, have you investigated over time the idea of taking the physical energy recovery devices on the tax, uh, parametric energy recovery or uh, flow energy recovery systems? Yeah, yeah. We've, we've tried in the past using the flow. Okay. Parametric is not. Uh, we could use parametric, we tried piezo, piezo sensors, and not successful because of the, the force that the animals do when they, when they move. It's not enough for the piezo to work. We've tried flow, but still uh, it's big, still uh, to give a proper, to give proper energy to, to charge the batteries, or at least for the transmission every hour. It's not enough. It was still too big for the tire and that adds weight um, and drag. So that's um, a lot of drag. And the animals don't like drag. It's like this. If we have a big backpack, mm -hmm. and big, yeah. and feel the weight for them is the same. For us, it looks small for us, but for them, it's, it's not good. Yeah. That was almost my question. Just that Use like a mechanical from a mechanical watch, a self-winding watch, to try and wind up a spring or something to boost the battery and give a little bit of a energy. Because the animals obviously are moving around, the seals are moving a lot. So yeah. You know, a self-winding watch. Yeah. You know, move a lot to yeah. wind up. Just maybe not enough. Power. That's a good idea. Um, maybe the wattage is not enough. Okay. Maybe for sleeping. Maybe for depression currents and for leakage. Maybe for that. But for that we have a solar cell already. Every time we'll have a solar cell just to counteract the leakage and the, the sleeping currents, mainly for that. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, Vertifer and uh, Narrowband IoT network. What's your experience or your opinion on that? Um, <coughs> I can't give you any feedback yet right. because we just got it. Okay. The, uh, the narrowband is not illuminated in the UK. You have to go to Reading, to their offices. They have a lab there if you want to test it. So until the illumination in the end of 2017, early 2018, I can't give you any feedback. It works, it's good, it's comparable to Lora, but different pieces model. I can say that they work really the same, but with a different business model. As Lora is, it's private. Everyone working yeah. for everyone. Uh, and the OIT is. is uh, <laughs> yes, it's <laughs> like. <laughs> how many tags do you think, uh, in terms of the ratio of tags to base stations, how many tags do you think you, you could scale up, you could get to uh, moving up, and what are your strategies for keeping track of uh, large amounts of, of tags at scale? That, that's a good question. We don't use Moro 1 on purpose. Okay, and the reason is that Moro 1 has an overhead of uh, energy and data transmission that we don't need. And by that, we can use the ISM frequency band uh, more often to transmit more or less data. How many devices or how many individuals we can have on the network, we still don't know because we're still scaling this. But we know that we will, we will not have more than 100, maybe 200 individuals. And even if you scatter base stations on the same geographical location um, as before, uh, as before, every base station has a random acknowledgement time. So when it, when all the base stations, if if all the base stations hear that time, they will have a random acknowledgement time. That means they will not reply at the same time. There is always the first that will reply, and then after a million seconds, the others reply. So 
I reckon that between 100 and 200 we are safe. After that, it starts to get. Guys, I think we're going to wind it up there. We'll, we'll return to Q and A later. Well, find me. We just find me later. Move on to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so Jay, thank you. So much.
This is not going to work. Skype. <coughs> Seriously, in this day and age? Come on. Uh, just a sec. He's going to be really annoyed when I say, back up and repeat yourself, because we can't hear anything. Speak a phone. Okay, we've got a serious packet loss, can't hear a thing. I'm going to have to put you on speakerphone so you can speak through the, uh, the mic. And hopefully your slides, yeah, you need to go back to your slides because you've just got a full screen of the, uh, the video camera. I think, is that the mic or is that the mic? Any idea? This one? Doesn't matter. Okay, now you need to mute your mic because you're getting echo. Let's see how this works. You with me? Yeah. Right, so um, you see my slide? 
Can you hear me okay? Hold on, no. Okay, hold on, hold on. Just a second. <laughs> it's going to work, right? Yeah, it might work. Thank you. Old school. Right, okay, you're good, you're good, you're good to go. Excellent, all right. If you can, if you can hear me okay, this is a good demonstration. And then sometime later, a manager signs that plan off and says, yeah, right, and there's an annual inspection plan. Um, it contained a lot of details, right, and it, it required a lot of work. So months are passing by in a business, and you need to be coordinating rope access teams, non-destructive testing teams, using things like ultrasound to test the, you know, the depth of metal and things like that, specialist technology. Some scaffolding, vessels, helicopters, bed space, food. There are, there are huge aspects to all these projects of getting people to go and look at stuff. And that's just to work out what's gone wrong. That's not to actually do anything, it's just to look at it. Um, and then you start preparing for the job. So you put things out to tender, you start getting equipment ready, all manner of admin tasks. Um, people travel halfway around the world to get the jobs. And then on the job, it's very complicated. Right? You can imagine that um, a bunch of people climbing around a ship that's up in dock or a oil platform or whatever it is, a wind turbine, a telephone mast, a bridge, things like that. These things take a lot of time and a lot of effort. Um, typically, in oil and gas, if you shut down a site that's costing you about $7 million a day and you are putting four people on site for eight weeks, or you can reverse those numbers, obviously, to, to cut the time down, so you've also got risk exposure because these people are in dangerous places doing, doing dangerous things that, if possible, we'd like to avoid. So this is, this is a huge business opportunity for a technology, right? Um, and then the output, unfortunately, as you can see in the top left-hand corner, is the result of this poor guy hanging on a rope trying to get the first-hand look at this stuff. That, that little bit of pipe work that he's, that he's kind of near there, the little kind of elbow bit, that should be a platform that he can stand on, but it, it, it's more the way to see, right? So he's like dangling down on the road trying to get a look at it to see what kind of condition it's in. Um, so these reports are kind of subjective. They're not, you know, they're, they're written by a person who's working in pretty, you know, they're not actually writing them at the time, but they're taking notes, they're taking those notes back. So it's kind of somewhat first-hand information, but not really, it's not this. And then um, it's hard. So. When that data comes back to the company, um, if I hope, oh, I think we just do a couple of clicks. When the report comes back to the company, it's usually taken quite some time, some weeks, to get that data together, and it comes back to the business. Somebody in the business gets that report and they start to create some kind of follow-up action. So eight years passed pretty much. That's what's involved here. And somebody then signs off and says, yep, those things are all broken. Let's start looking at fixing them next year. And then amazingly in parallel, lots of other people in the business are all actually doing similar activities for different reasons. And this is just how it is, you know, that old adage of they're constantly painting the Golden Gate Bridge when you paint, finish painting at one end and start going through the rest. That's kind of the nature of this business. It's, it's high and boring. So, drones are great. We all know what drones do. Little, little helicopters with batteries and computer brains. You know, the, we, we haven't used petrol helicopters in the past for doing this kind of work because, you know, like we, there's been hobbyists flying aeroplanes down at the park for years, but they've not really been used for any kind of crap application in business because of the limitations. When you've got flying robots, you can do a lot more. So this is what the drone industry does, and this is what um, the business that's got to do is it. Generally, what the expectation is, is that the drone will fly every day. So you're constantly hoovering up data, visual inspection data. And 
this, this is interesting from a business perspective for those who are interested in drones, right? When, when you think about this from an Internet of Things perspective, the, the drone you can see in the picture there is, I think it's 50,000 euros, something like that, and it's specialist at the moment, but that price will come down. And the guy in the picture there is a Sky Pizza employee who is brought out because you need to be a specialist person who knows what they're doing in order to fly a 50,000 foot drone safely around a major hazard facility. Um, you, need, you, know, you need legal permits and insurance and all of that kind of stuff. But we, we all know with the Internet of Things, it doesn't work if people are doing the specialist work, right? It's like somebody buying a smart washing machine oh, yeah. and then somebody, I, I can't, yeah. yeah. We're getting a little bit of distortion. Do you have like a Bluetooth headset? Or can you speak a little bit less close to the mic? There's a little bit of distortion. Yeah. No problem there, it's better. Yeah. Give that a go. Okay. Cheers. So the the concept of this is that in the early days of this this you can think of it as a you know a technology solution fit, right? As this evolves into product market fit. What's going to happen is that person flying the drone will be a person who's already on the platform. So they're not a third party that's brought in. So that we can only see the end of our business approaching, right? And this, this is the truth for our drone inspection businesses. Ultimately, what we need to do is enable people to have these drones themselves. So we work it out and then we sell that methodology on to the businesses that they actually have staff there full time. And that's the idea. So we're building the technology platform, which, um, let's go back to the presentation. The idea is that you, you fly the drone, the drone lands, the data goes up to the cloud, and then this is what we present our customers with. So it's a, it's a portal where, I'll give you a demonstration of it now, where um, we take the data and do something clever with it. Right, so I just switch to another tab here in this window. So this is the software that we offer. So the idea is that um, somebody goes down to an old platform, they, they do a flight, they collect a bunch of imagery and video, and that, that's what people are collecting today, whether it's visible, live, or thermal imagery. And they upload it to a cloud platform. And here's an example of what a client would then do. So because it's in the cloud, anybody who works for that business anywhere in the world, then log in and see the data soon after it's been captured by the drone. Um, so I clicked on that blue dot, I'm loading a, a close-up view of that facility in that part of the world. And um, what's happening when the drone lands is that all of the image data that's coming in is, is all kind of smart information. It's got the telemetry information of the drone, so we know the compass bearing, and the GPS coordinates, and things like that. That's not great at the moment, to be honest, as you guys know, because GPS location, as we saw earlier tonight, is not very accurate. It's, you know, tens of meters accuracy, which if you're trying to find a very important crack in a pipe, you need to know in detail which are less than 10 meters, right? So there's other techniques that we have to bring in. Um, using image analysis to try and you know, you use GPS as a heuristic to get in the right ballpark, and then you use image analysis to find the thing in detail. So here we've got a very small kind of 3D model of, um, of a platform loading. My machine sends up to line at the moment, doing a lot. And um, all of the image information, video information of the drone is organized and put into a system for people to be able to get access to it easily. So here's, here's that oil platform. And you see there's some red things. So some problems have been spotted within the imagery. And when I click on the red dot I'm taken to, the cracked cap. And you can see in this, um, in this image that, depending on what quality you're getting of the style, there's, um, there's, there's detailed imagery of a crack in a, in a weld ring force ring on and what is actually a critical piece of equipment on this site, this, this offshore facility. But what else is important is this flare is still burning. So this is not possible without a drone. You know, if you were standing there taking that picture, you, you'd be cooked. So it's, um, it's pretty incredible. This is um, a drone flying 20 meters from the object with really, really high power. 
um, which is which is pretty exciting. If I go to another example, just here we, there's a problem with this pipe, and if I just load the um, if I just load this video, on, you can see that it's you know, it's really engaging. You you can from your desktop anywhere in the world get to this important information showing these issues here, then you can manage it. So flying drones is only really just you know it's a quicker way of putting up a ladder unless you're doing something with that data. So it's really, you know, it's, it's the internet things is really part of, you know, it's the cloud processing and the image analysis technology that really empowers drones to be useful. Otherwise you might as well just use a GoPro on a selfie stick. So I've scaled this image manually. Um, and what I can do is using using some seeds, um, I'm we're kind of we're in this we're at the stage of training classifiers here. Um, I can mark up corrosion and then get a quantification of it. So you can see I'm passed back a version of the image which has the extent of the problem quantified. So if you, if you piece that into the story where a drone in a box is taking off every day, systematically photographing the entire surface area, we stitch the entire thing together into an author mosaic, we pass every single image through a um, we chop that back up into tiles, we pass every image into a, a corrosion identifier and quantifier, and when a drone takes off and lands every day, instead of producing just a, a media library, it's going to produce, um, it's just basically an update dashboard that says, here's the problems and this is how much worse they've got today, and that will give you your priorities as to what you've got to fix. So it's a, it's a huge step forward for what is a very dangerous, expensive, invasive method of um, inspecting things manually. And drones are really, you know, they're, they're kind of saving lives and things, saving people hundreds of millions um, within our clients. It's really good to come work. And it's got lots of um, lots of future potential as well with other, other problems that we can spot with thermal imagery. And we can use hyperspectral cameras to look at um, you know, kind of crystalline structures and metal and things like that to try and see problems before they even occur. Um, but yeah, there you go, that's my 20 minute time. Excellent, thank you. Round of applause. So let's call them flocks of drones. <laughs> so now they'll be buzzing around doing extraordinary things. And uh, this kind of stuff is, is so sophisticated. But it's being applied to something which is essentially structure health monitoring, OK? But that translates into to billions and billions and billions of dollars of value throughout many different heavy industries. So if you're a company operating this market sector, to change, to, you know, obvious, you know, uh, uh, payday waiting for you. There are big multi-gazillion dollar companies who need this product and service. So, uh, are you looking for, for investment? Sign me up, Colin. Okay, so we're going to move on quickly now, briefly to an audience Q&A. Uh, do you guys want to come up to the front, just grab a seat, and we'll just do, and also let's open the discussion, because you know that I like it. <coughs> so grab a seat. So I like to do. Uh, so, are you going to come up? Uh, Colin, if you can hear me, yeah. maximize your face on the screen and join us. So, ditch your slides. Um, maybe shift towards the microphone because you guys don't have a look at my right now. Here. So, that the mic feet can pick up. There we go. That's better. All right. So, what's, what's, uh, sorry, I should be pointing uh, this laser pointer. Line of people in the audience. Somebody had a question, and I cut you off rudely, and it was to Sergio, I think. Was that you? This is me. What's yeah, your name again? It was, it was Blue Flow. 
What's your name again? Paul. Paul, that's it. Are you on the hang that guy? Yes, I was. Uh, what? Well, yeah, I was. Really? You quit now? I quit now, yeah. Okay, that's another story. Maybe another story another time. <laughs> but I just want to talk about it now. I still. still okay, go ahead, sorry. I'm, I can design stuff, no way. <laughs> okay, you had a question. Well, it, it, it was, it was the, the um, turbines, small turbines on the mammal. As it flows through the sea, it will, it will generate electricity to power the batteries. Yeah, um, that's, that's a very good idea. Thank you yeah. for that. Um, the only thing that is more important to us than energy for, this, for the electronic system is the energy that the animal has to sustain, has to waste. Yeah, for to move. So we've been designing a new um, envelope for our tag in partnership with uh, Plymouth University. We've uh, we have a new envelope already. That's that's going to be on these ta tags in April. And adding something like that uh, with the cable uh, to the tag, it's an increase of a minimum double the energy consumption in, in the animal. So, yeah, it's not good for animal welfare, as essentially we're saying. Okay, that is an important that's, question. That's the that was going to be my question, actually. Have you had any issues with animal welfare? Or perhaps we don't even know you're attaching these weird horns onto seals and that. Did the animal welfare people are going to get onto you when there's more awareness of this? Yeah, is that an issue as far as you're concerned? Um, it's an issue, of course, and everything is uh, regulated. Okay. Everything's very good. There are a number of uh, licenses per year. So you get, you get spot checks from alpha, animal welfare associations? How does that work? Do you say that? Yeah, they know what we do. Okay, so Mainly, they're checking the weight, the size, the dimensions. Yeah. I see. And, and also how the animals are uh, captured, because they have to be captured. We need to put tags on. Okay. Right? And right. Uh, most of them have, have, been, have to be tranquilized. Uh, and they are glued to that. And, uh, and the purpose of what? The animals, ultimately you're doing this for the ecosystem. So ultimately you are doing this for the benefit of the animals, right? Yep. Or no? What is the point of this research? It's the benefits of the animals, to study the animals, to study the ecosystem, um, to find answers to questions that you can only answer with this kind of topic. So give us some examples of okay. some breakthrough insights um, you've learned. The, um, the, Wind generators off the coast of Scotland. Um, there was no idea. First thought was that uh, the, all the animals would, would swim away from the wind generator farms, the farms. But with this system, we got to know that they go there, swim around the coast and the water. And so they, they like it because the. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> the wind generation poles uh, start to, to form bio life around biofouling, so all the fish will there. So it's actually benefiting the ecosystem. Absolutely. I, I just heard Dr. Ben trying to be to see about that very thing. Yeah, most of the sea is in fact sterile. A little sterile, but there's not much there. As soon as you put something there, it attracts a whole series of different forms of life. Exactly. And, 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 and that's what's happening. Yeah. Away from the away from the shore, there isn't a great deal out there. Well they used to sink um, cars and you can see. Yeah, the people make artificial reefs to, to try and um, attract workers more. Yeah, so that episode of Brand Tour where they were chucking cars into yeah. to try you know, literally disposing of car um, <coughs> chassis. And chucking them and creating these uh, artificial reefs. It's amazing. And they came on to the metal work. And uh, sorry. Uh, so, just a question. You, you're talking about Laura. Um, I don't know much about it. What frequency does that operate at? Um, you have, for Europe, for us in UK, you have 434 megahertz or 868 megahertz. And we are using 868. Smaller antennas, uh, better penetration. Thank you. Actually, um, okay, well, just a quick one to start. Um, blue whale, if you were tracking a blue whale, presumably okay. you just put a pretty big um, transmitter on that. Um, we don't go for big mammals because 
um, you, the only way to attach is with invasive process. Okay. And so, ethically, we don't want to do that. That's uh, something that the team doesn't want to do. So unless someone develops a good enough uh, suction cup that will stay for more than two days, that's the average, two, three days. So the other thing was that I'm hoping to sort of marry the first and the last talk together with this suggestion, okay? Yeah. Um, so I'll try and be very concise with it, but I'm a very keen forager of wild mushrooms, and over the years I've been taking photographs. You're a funky geek. I think exactly. My apologies to Fungi. Fungi. You're a fun guy. Uh, anyway, um, over the years, I've been field courses and we're taking, I've been taking digital photographs. Now, the great thing now with my iPhone is that it tags the GPS location of the mushrooms that I find. So I can go back and look at the dates, and I can go back and see exactly the same spot and know that that fungus is growing there because they'll maintain it soil for 20, 30 years. Um, the other thing that I can find interesting is using Google Maps to actually locate areas with specific types of trees that I know there's going to be things like chanterelles and seps and good edible mushrooms. Now, with the very sensitive logging data, I could probably tag exactly the spot, the square meter, where those mushrooms are, and then also to hopefully get a drone to come in instead of going to visit other fish, the drone will then go and find those mushrooms for me and tell me that they're there, and I'm going to pick them without wasting a day. So, package drone. It's I, I, I think there's so many exciting applications. It's ridiculous. Do our bidding. I can't wait for it. Um, okay. So, do you have any more things? Sorry, go ahead. I, I cannot hear it. So if you use the camera, you would be able to hear very close to your previous location. Right. Because computer vision is even more efficient than all the other sensors you have on the phone. It can uh, so you triangulate between the tree, different tree stumps and uh, between the certain. You would be able to the distance much, much more accurately than. Do you think we could book truffle pigs out of business? These truffle drones instead. Have a little basket hanging underneath the drone. Like some of these truffles. Build it. Make it happen. Who wants to go to truffles in England and France and all over the world? I'm being able to spot them and detect them. It's a, it's, a, it's a multi million pound business. And it's a big what is it? Truffle, truffle farming. Yeah, yeah. Big, yeah, big time. I love truffles. So, a question for Colin. I don't know if he'll be able to hear me. Colin, can you hear? I can hear you. Ask your question. Yeah. Ask your question. Yeah. Okay, I'll relay it to you. So, can you talk us through the process of developing this company from being drone flying to being a software and data company? Yeah, so um, Colin, can you hear me? I can, yeah. Yeah, so right now you've just got a bunch of guys with a remote control helicopter effectively. And, yeah. and it's a great business, there's nothing wrong with that. You're replace, uh, replacing uh, uh, drones with, uh, what is it, uh, uh, ghosts with ropes? That's, that's not me, that's like an yeah. industry term. Um, yeah. And of course you're transitioning now into a big data analytics company where drones are just simply your eyes and ears um, to these high value industrial assets. So how do you transition into becoming that sort of data analytics, that high value data analytics rather than just simply a drone company? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. I think it's, it's a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy in that if you do lots of drone flights, you just produce masses and masses of data. So you have to build a tool that will that will hold it. So there, there's companies out there that you know they're, they're just drone pilots. They don't they don't have inspection engineers. That's an important first step. So um, actually turning the drone data into business intelligence into actual actionable information is a, is a key first step. Um, and then once you've been, you know, we've been doing that systematically now for about seven years, which is a very long time in the drone business. And we've built tools that can automate it. And you effectively, when you look at the alternative of sending a guy with a rope or just producing 10 gigabytes of video data and giving it to your client and saying, there you go, pay my invoice, that doesn't, neither of those things are preferable. So if, if you can handle 
if, if you basically offer a complete, like, drawn up a service where the drone flies, and then at the end of it, you get kind of some a dashboard with traffic lights on it telling you you do or don't have problems, it, it just won't follow us right after the other. It's really, um, the, it's just a perfect next step forward. It's not a challenge to, to get to that people kind of, uh, the, it's like the market's pulling it out of us rather than us pushing it. Okay, I think uh, we're going to wind things up in a little bit. Five minutes, so two quick questions, and then I think we'll end it there. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Asif. Uh, I've got a question for Colin. So, with this amount of big data, and as you said, over a period of seven years, there must be masses of data. So, are, are his clients interested in predicting failure? So, oh, yeah. So, you're going to be pivoting towards. Uh, uh, algorithms, presumably, Colin, that do your structure health monitoring, prediction, analysis, hypo hypothesis and diagnosis algorithms, so you can transition from scheduled maintenance to predictive maintenance to predict the failure of a component, a part, particularly if it results in um, damage to life or, or high value assets again. So is, is that where you're headed? You're using prognosis and diagnosis to predict uh, structural failure in advance of it actually happening? Yeah, I mean, to be to be humble about it, I see we probably have to hook into an incumbent, you know, two hundred million dollar SAP, um, you know, system that is getting a lot of sense data back already. I see us as one part of the of the feed. So if something's vibrating and we've looked at it with a thermal camera and some other information, maybe you know the actual process condition, the, the temperature of the fluid going through it or something. Um, when you pull all that together, you can answer the question. And I would love to say that yeah, we'll we'll build that. But I think we really need to be to be honest. I think the marketplace for internet things technology is that you have to have your niche and you have to be able to talk to the other people to get the results out. And that's what we're working on at the moment. Because otherwise, we'd be I think we'd be biting off too much. I think also there are some major liability issues. I mean, look at uh, yeah. say aviation allegedly. They were responsible for the prognosis algorithms for Hums for uh, uh, rotary uh, aircraft helicopters. Yeah. So uh, you know, Bond, CHC, uh, Bristow, all those operators that take passengers to and from rigs, oil rigs via uh, aircraft. So the the health and uh, uh, utilization monitoring solutions that are supposed to predict failure using algorithms for failing these at these. Uh, remember these years ago these. Uh, uh, helicopters were ditching in the North Atlantic and uh, they were experiencing failures based on incorrect information. They had not realized that these aircraft were being pushed well beyond their, uh, their sort of uh, designed intended usage and as a result they were getting all kinds of failures and the entire fleet were grounded, lawsuits being thrown here, there and everywhere. So if you're saying, don't worry about it, trust your algorithms, and uh, you know, we think this widget um, is going to break, and you know, it's got another 10,000 uh, useful hours of, of life, and it fails, you know, algorithms you know, uh, don't deliver, and then it leads to, like I said, millions of, of pounds worth of lost productivity, or maybe you know, loss of life, then you've got to be really sure that your algorithms are going to predict failure um, without any kind of uh, Inaccuracies. Is that a fair point in terms of liability? Yeah, I mean it's a really good point. And I think what it what it points to is that the, all of this technology is not intended to put people out of work. I think that's a massive misconception of the internet things. And all we're trying to do in all, in all of these technologies, not these different, you know, whether it's aviation or oil and gas or you know energy, and we work a lot with wind turbines and things like that. If you can take all, take away all the grunt, expensive, dangerous hours, but you still have a team with the same size, you can do a lot more with that information that you've got. So in theory, it's not about collecting the data with a sensor and producing a graph and sacking the guy that used to take those measurements. It's about getting that guy to analyze that information that's being produced. And then, you know, if the whole, the whole industry ratchets up one notch and becomes more intelligent. So it, it's, at the same time, there's a liability issue, but equally, there's a huge opportunity for everyone to get smarter, I think, 
And if people don't get that, if they just replace the checkout bill with a, with a machine that keeps telling you there's an unexpected item in the packing area, then um, it's not going to be nice for anybody. <laughs> so is everyone, uh, anyone familiar with the term mixed initiative? There's a lot of empirical evidence to support that high-functioning teams are just made up of humans um, or just uh, robots um, are outperformed by teams that are made up of humans and robots. In other words, mixed initiative, which I think is what Colin's saying that humans can bring a lot of insight by leveraging the data and vice versa, robots and AIs, obviously, are not quite as good at, as humans at certain things, and of course uh, robots are much better than humans at other things. So I think it's a match made in heaven. So let's kind of end it there. You did have one last question, do you want to make it very, very quick? Uh, just a quickie, yeah, I'm just wondering whether you're unique in doing what you're doing, or whether there are um, others <coughs> doing it because um, it seems Cyber to be <coughs> technologically Sorry. very analogous to what you'd expect people sitting in silos in Texas bombing Syria to be doing. <laughs> so I think uh, you're not the only uh, show in town, but I think you're, I mean, there is uh, a local competitor who has spoken at previous events, um, Cyberhawk. Uh, but I, I would say you have uh, a pretty good claim of being a, uh, the market leader, would you say? I mean, hey, I've got to be impartial here, so it's up to you to do your side pitch. But what was the question specifically? Are there other American military spin offs not doing very similar things technologically? Remote monitoring, machine intelligence, and business intelligence. Yeah, if you're going to have competition in the marketplace, you're in too early. So I would very much hope, because this is a multi billion dollar sector. If you didn't have competitors, I would be very concerned, and I'm assuming that you do. And some of the big boys, like Lockheed's and the uh, Tales and, and VA Systems, those are the kinds of guys that you'll, you'll yeah, exactly. So, I, I think what, essentially you've got a legacy issue with the big uh, aerospace defense companies like uh, Raytheon, and they're from the aerospace industry, so they use jet propellant fuel. These guys are coming from consumer electronics, so gyroscope. Essentially, they're, they're, uh, they're mobile, they're sophisticated flying mobile phones. So you've got two completely different ends of the uh, industry, and the big guys are looking at these more dynamic uh, DJI, um, for example, the, the, the consumer drone manufacturer. They're, they're going to sell well in excess of a billion drones. Now, how many drones will a BAE system sell? Probably that, that many, but yeah, high value is a completely different market. You know the company the Boston Dynamics um, with, the, with the robot horses, you know? This isn't just about um, drones, this is about any robots that monitor anything. Absolutely. But, and, and culturally, I mean, I go to drone events, industrial drone events, and I can see it's like two schools of thought. You've got the old school incumbents that, like I said, have come from a very heavy industry, aerospace, industrial background, and then the new kids on the block that are using components that have been, been traditionally found in mobile phones, consumer electronics, all trying to solve similar problems, but from a different kind of perspective. And I suspect probably all the innovation is going on with the startup ecosystem, within the startup ecosystem, and the big guys are just going to apply them. They're going to wait. Uh, wait for the market to mature, and then because they've got big bucks, they'll just go, they'll just start throwing some cash around, and they'll probably end up being acquired by VAE or I don't know. Yeah. I was just going to say, uh, I think it's two approaches. One's a technological uh, big dog type uh, approach, and the other one's asset management. And that's yeah. a business, the key thing about this is a business approach. It's asset management, it's managing the asset of, of oil rigs, it's managing the asset of all these um, uh, windmills out in the, uh, in the middle of the North Sea or, or whatever. It's, it's, a business, it's a business approach. I mean, the types of drones you use um, in uh, Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, they are not fit for purpose when it comes to these niche yes. applications. They're way too expensive. Um, they uh, need to be in the air for days, I think. Um, and they're, like I said, they're using, they're not, they're not battery powered, they're using uh, jet propulsion fuel and they're fixed wing generally, so they're not as nimble, they're not as, uh, like I said, fit the, the for DOD purpose. in America has been commissioning companies creating little tiny robots. Micro drones. Yeah. Micro drones yeah. to monitor close up on battlefield. Uh, yeah, and have you seen the I know what you're saying is right, but they are also into 
the small scale. But you've seen the cost of those companies. Yeah. I mean, in Poetry Run, you're talking about, what, a quarter of a million? Yeah. Whereas you can easily hack a DJI and do pretty much the same job for under five grand. So, you know, in terms of economies of scale, all the innovation is happening at the grassroots within, you know, this single ecosystem. But you're right, the big boys are, are not paying attention to it and discounting it when, in fact, I think they'll be out innovated. So they'll either be killed off or they'll go through um, an, a, an aggressive acquisition a strategy of buying up all these small innovative <laughs> Anyway, I think uh, we should probably end it there. Um, there is, I think, alcohol left. <laughs> so it's important that that alcohol is not there by the time we leave the room. Is that fair? David? Yeah. Yeah. It's there for a reason, right? So let's drink it. Okay, so a round of applause for our... Andrews, I think you're probably going to take uh, an award for the, the furthest travel today, so thank you so much, Sergio. Right, drinks. And I don't know if I'll get a bar or a bar. Okay, we'll do it for a time. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes.